Hey, you viewers and viewers, my name is General Red Stratist. Welcome back to Danganronpa, if this time, <laughs> part 56 of Danganronpa 2, basically. We're going to continue on with this light novel we started in the last episode, and so far I think it's very, very interesting. So the storyline is, alternate storyline of Tricky Happy Havoc, Sayaka is not dead, Mukuro is not dead, but in Mukuro's place, Makoto has taken the spears. So I'm interested to see um, where this goes, because it's said that from now, this is Mukuro's story. Huh? Time had certainly stopped for Mukuro and Kasaba. We're just going to throw ourselves back in, everyone. So if you don't know uh, where we're up to, go and watch the last episode. It was as if everything around her had frozen perfectly still. In the past, she was known as the ultimate soldier. She'd experienced this feeling before, during her time with the mercenary group Fenrir. In situations where she was surrounded by a hopeless number of enemies within the jungle, or in a desert ruin, the charging enemies seemed as though they were frozen in time which allowed her to claim a decisive victory in all her battles. This wasn't a battlefield, so why did this familiar sensation activate once again? In order to, uh, in order to understand what had happened, Mukuro slowly tried to assess the current situation from within this frozen world. Junko and Mukuro were both children of despair, but Junko Enoshima, the true ultimate despair, harbours a far deeper darkness within her. Though their last names are different, Mukuro is Junko's older sister, connected by the bonds of blood. She cooperated with Junko's hopeless plan, and impersonated her under the pretense of participating in the killing game alongside her classmates. According to the plan, Mukuro was supposed to oppose Monokuma, who her sister was controlling, and be locked in a dungeon as punishment. Isolated from the others, she would then escape the dungeon and perform various acts intended to deprive the students of hope. That was the role she had been assigned. When Makoto succumbed to his headache, Junko ordered her to see if the shock had caused him to remember anything that could make him a liability. He woke up as she was tending to him, so she made small talk with him, but she didn't notice any change in his behaviour. Until this point, she was certain that there shouldn't be any problems. Nothing could possibly go wrong. She stomped on Monokuma like her sister ordered her to do, and flawlessly spoke the line she was taught to memorise. Afterward, she would fall through a trapdoor into the dungeon and remain isolated from the other students. That was her role. She hadn't done anything wrong. There were no problems. There were no problems. She repeated that to herself over and over like a silent prayer. Okay, <laughs> that should have been her voice again. But in that frozen moment in time, what she saw was not a trapdoor, but countless spears. One of them had skewered Makoto through his side. Why? Makoto? Why are there spears? I think I'll change her voice to make it a bit more impactful. Gungnir? I would have died if I hadn't moved. Did Junko mess up the plan? No. Junko would never mess up. Was she trying to kill me? Me? Makoto saved me? Why? Why did he say my name? Did his memories come back? Did I not realise that? Did I make a mistake? Is that why Junko got angry? Is this punishment? Is it my fault? Junko tried to kill me. Kill me. Kill me. Kill me. Slowly, time came back to her world. Mukuro could feel her face turning pale as she slowly looked toward Makoto. The students' screams rang throughout the gym. Sayaka was probably the first one to scream. But who screamed first didn't matter to Mukuro. Koto, why? Koto was the ultimate lucky student. He had been her classmate for the past two years, and was he, now he was a sacrifice to despair. Not long ago, he had given her an answer of sorts during, her, during their conversation in the nurse's office. He was just a pawn in the plan her sister had devised. But now, a feeling of doubt began forming in Mukuro's mind. I... What did I want from Makoto? As her heart churned restlessly, she continued to think. In return, I promise that if I do decide to kill someone, it won't be you. Was I impersonating Junko then? Or did I really mean that? When did I start feeling this doubt? Just now, the moment he saved me? Or when we spoke in the nurse's office earlier? When I first confronted him about this killing game before his memories returned? Or was it before even that? Mukuro stood there, confused and overwhelmed, as Makoto slowly opened his eyes, the spear still impaling him through the side. Oh, Mukuro! 
Makoto, are you okay? Mukuro was no longer impersonating the ultimate fashionista. Looking up from the floor of the gym, Makoto asked, Why are you dressed up like Junko? <laughs> Sorry, the Northern English accent probably doesn't do anything for the seriousness of this situation, but uh, I'll keep my voices up. He was smiling. Maybe he couldn't feel the pain anymore. Or maybe he was being affected by something else. But regardless, Makoto ignored the fact that he was dying just to give Mukuro his warm smile. I'm glad. I'm glad you're safe, Mukuro. As soon as she heard Makoto's weak, fading voice, something inside Mukuro snapped. From within the shell of despair she had built up, an intense emotion began flowing out. No, this is all wrong. She couldn't hold back that emotion any longer. No. No. And for the first time in her entire life, Mukuro unleashed a scream into the world. Oh, man. As Mukuro fell to her knees and clutched her head, a small shadow started walking toward her back. The stuffed animal that had been under her foot. Monokuma. His claws were extended, and he was no longer walking with his usual waddle. Instead, he moved like a, si uh, like a beast silently stalking its prey as he slowly advanced within his target's blind spot. As he inched closer to Mukuro, Monokuma raised his razor-sharp claws, crouched on his haunches, and suddenly leapt toward the back of her neck. However, just before those claws, claws could reach the paralysed Mukuro, a dark shadow moved in from the side and swatted those claws away with one blow. His lunge deflected, Monokuma was sent flying through the air, spinning wildly, wildly even, before crashing into the wall. Uh, assuming this is Monokuma speaking. Damn you! What are you trying to do? Oh, no, it's Sakura, is it? Okay. Sakura Ogami, the ultimate martial artist, had just prevented another tragedy. She stood before Monokuma and, dressed, and addressed him in a loud, booming voice. Oh, God. Um, right. Sakura's voice was very gravelly, and I recall it being one that actually kills my throat very quickly. So, I'll try my best here, everyone. Not only did you attempt to kill Junko for violating school regulations, you even attacked Makoto, who had nothing to do with this. If you plan to continue acting in such a savage manner, there's no reason for us to play along with your game. Was that Sakura's voice? I can't quite remember. I'm going to go with that. Byakuya Togami, the real ultimate affluent progeny, <laughs> smirked condescendingly at Sakura. Fool. One could say you've now violated school regulations with your senseless actions. He looks as if he honestly did not care if his fellow students lived or died at all. Uh, I don't know who's talking here. Well, she merely deflected the headmaster's attack just now. Okay, it's Celeste. So I'll do the German voice. Well, she merely deflected the headmaster's attack just now, so I do not think it truly counts as an act of violence. Like Byakia, Celeste seemed unfazed as she chided him over his words. However, the banter between the two was enough to stir the stunned students, uh, the stunned students to action. Makoto! Sayako was the first one to run toward Makoto, who lay bleeding from his stomach. But Monokuma stopped her, shouting in a tone of voice that seemed completely out of character. Oh, okay. Be careful! Don't get too close to those two! Huh? Startled by Monokuma's desperate tone, Sayaka and the others stopped moving almost instinctively. The students looked around at each other. Instead of his usual playful gait, Monokuma walked toward them with deliberate, methodical steps. And then, he suddenly blurted out something that took everyone, including Mukuro, Mukuro Ikusaba, by surprise. I'm sure you're probably confused by this sudden turn of events, but I want you guys to work together! Oh? As Mukuro slowly turned her head toward Monokuma, he pointed at her and yelled, Mukuro Ikusaba and her accomplice Makoto Naegi are the terrorists responsible for locking you all inside the academy! Once again, time stopped for Mukuro. But this time, she wasn't the only one affected. Everyone seemed to be frozen in shock. After a few seconds of silence, Aoi Asahina, the ultimate swimming pro, spoke first. Huh? You're kidding, right? I mean... Makoto is a terrorist? That's impossible. And who's Mukuro anyway? I mean, that's Junko. Monokuma began slowly explaining to Aoi. The real Junko must be in prison somewhere in this school. Worst case scenario, she might be killed. Mukuro must have researched which one of you would be easiest for her to impersonate. The hid among you all by pretending to be her. 
She was probably trying to make sure the killing game went smoothly. Suddenly, Monokuma's hands and feet began jerking in, in an awkward motion as he looked at the other students and introduced himself. What? I'm Bashiki Madurai, the ultimate hacker. I'm your upper class man. I hacked into the academy from the outside, and I was finally able to take control of Monokuma's body just a little while ago. Uh, is this how he's still speaking? Take control? From, from who? From the head of the terrorist organization that's controlling this robot from the outside. So, Bashiki Madurai. Now, in the last episode, it mentioned Danganronpa Zero, another novel. Is Bashiki Madurai from that one? Maybe? I don't know. What? What are you saying, Junko? Mukuro trembled as she heard the words coming out of Monokuma's mouth. For a brief moment, she clung to the hope that her sister wasn't trying to kill her, but as soon as that hope was born, it was immediately consumed by despair. Junko had the power to transform hope into despair. She would never let anyone hack her that easily. There was only one explanation. Junko Enoshima was pretending to be someone named Bashiki in order to frame Mukuro and Makoto. It was as though Junko was using Mukuro's survival as a branching path to lead the students to a different despair. Monokuma continued talking, telling the students more lies designed to prompt them to action. On your first day at Hopesbury Academy, you guys were exposed to sleeping gas, knocked unconscious and taken hostage. Mukuro and Makoto are probably the only operatives that terrorists sent inside the school. That means they probably know how to escape from here. And then Monokuma turned to face Mukuro. Mukuro Ikusaba was a member of a mercenary group called Fenrir. She's a wanted criminal who's killed over 10 people associated with the school. So don't get soft and think you can capture her alive. In fact, that's exactly what the cops told me. So the moment I saw an opening, I tried hacking the trap they set and tried to kill her. But what about Makoto? Monokuma gave a cold, emotionless answer to Sayaka's question. My guess is that a measly little ultimate lucky student didn't stand a chance of defying a group like Fenrir. He was probably threatened and forced to cooperate before he went to the school, or, judging from his earlier actions, maybe Mukuro seduced him. Sayaka's face went pale when she heard that answer, and she immediately stopped talking. Mukuro raised her head and shouted, You're wrong. Makoto isn't a terrorist. You all have to believe me. The whole gym fell silent, and then, as if he was speaking for everyone there, Taka stepped forward and nervously asked, Hold on, what do you mean? Makoto isn't a terrorist. It sounds like you're saying that there's no doubt that you, in fact, are a terrorist. I ask that you correct yourself at once and say, we are not terrorists. Celeste began expressing her own doubts as well. It is strange, Yar. Does it not seem odd that she is so protective of someone we all just met a few days ago? Mukuro stood in silence. The other students' faces began to fill with suspicion and doubt as they realised they weren't looking at the real Junko Enoshima. Byakia pushed up his glass glassed, should say glasses probably, and began coldly pointing out what seemed out of place to him. I've heard that fool Makoto, or whatever his name is, call you Mukuro instead of Junko. How would Makoto know that your name is really Mukuro, really Mukuro if he just met you not that long ago? That's... I've also heard of Fenrir, con continued Byakia. As I recall, its members have a tattoo somewhere on their body. Instinctively, Byakia's words put Mukuro into a calm state of mind. In hostile situations, her defensive reflexes, as the ultimate soldier, often manifested themselves. Mukuro's tattoo was on the back of her right hand. She wondered how she could hide this from the other students without also calling attention to it. Well, hang on a minute. Doesn't she have it covered? In foundation or whatever? Because wasn't that the thing in the previous game? How they worked out that she was masquerading as Junko? Well, one of the ways they did it, but was because when they saw her body again, the foundation had come off her hand. So can't she just... Does she not have it on now? Can she not just hold up her right hand and say, look, there's nothing there? But in the end, this concern was in vain. If the police's records are true, she should have a tattoo on the back of her right hand. As Monokuma... Oh, right. Well, as Monokuma speaking, as Monokuma freely divulged that information. All right, cried Taka, his voice filled with enthusiasm. Show us the back of your right hand and prove your innocence. Monokuma dispensed another unnecessary remark. Make sure you look real close. She might have covered it up with foundation. Okay, right. 
<laughs> there you go. So yeah, he's referring back to what happened in the last game then. That makes sense. Junko had ordered Mukuro to hide her tattoo with Foundation, so Monokuma's information was entirely true. There was nothing Mukuro could do except stay quiet. However, she wasn't staying quiet because her identity was about to be exposed. She was struck by the realisation that her sister was completely serious about pinning this on her. But why the hesitation? shouted the foolishly honest Taka. As my classmate, I have complete faith in you. From behind him, Hifumi Yamada, the ultimate fanfic creator, murmured to himself as cold sweat ran down his cheeks. Oh god, this was the <laughs> this was the lispy nerd voice. Um, hold on. Well, look at that. I guess this is what they call a checkmate, huh? Um, that sounds like Mondo. What was Mondo? He was like, gravelly but more aggressive. Why don't you just fess up already, you fucking bastard? That was not, that was not Mondo's voice. I can't remember what Mondo's was now. In contrast to Hifumi, Mondo Awada, the ultimate biker gang leader, was royally pissed. However, there were some students who were busy questioning Monokuma instead of Mukuro. Um, Leon, Leon. That was in a sort of American accent, wasn't it? Hey, you're not coming to save us? shouted Leon Kuwata, the ultimate baseball star. You should hurry up and change and charge in here already. Monokuma looked at Leon and shook his head softly. The police can't help you right now. Not only are you guys hostages, it's possible that the entire school has been rigged with explosives and poison ga poisonous gas. I hacked into this Monokuma robot to investigate that for myself. Then what about everyone on that DVD? Oh no wait, this is Sayaka. And what about everyone on that DVD? What about everyone outside the school? asked Sayaka. The memory of the DVD she was forced to watch yesterday still weighed heavily on her mind, but Monokuma didn't have a clear answer. I don't know anything about any DVDs, but there are definitely terrorists causing havoc out here. Law enforcement around the world is in shambles trying to deal with this. That's impossible. Sayaka shuddered and collapsed to her knees. Sayaka. Next to her, Chihiro Fujisaki, the ultimate programmer, was unsure about what she should do. Behind her, two other girls stood silently. The first was Toko Fukawa, the ultimate writing prodigy. She seemed to be trying very hard not to look at Makoto as he lay bleeding, because <laughs> otherwise she'll faint and turn into Genocide Jack. The other was a quiet girl who hadn't talked about herself much, named Kyoko Kirigiri. Unlike Toko, Kyoko was watching everything intently, as if she, as if she was studying the scene of a crime. From Makoto's breathing patterns to subtle changes in Mukuro's facial expression, nothing was escaping her attention. Suddenly, Toko began nervously talking to Sakura. Oh no. Oh god, it's the Toko voice. Oh, can I still do the Toko voice? <laughs> so anyway, I to say the Mukuro woman, or whoever over there is a t -t terrorist. Hurry up and beat her to death or something. Yep, yeah, I can still do the Toko voice. We don't know that yet, said Sakura. My fists do not met out justice based on simple speculation. Sakura tried to get near Makoto to examine his wounds, but Monokuma stood in her way, shouting, Don't come any closer! This meant that Mukuro was the only one who could get close to Makoto. She had ended countless lives on the battlefield. She knew from experience. If she didn't treat Makoto's wounds, he would die. His wounds were not immediately fatal, but if he continued losing blood, he would eventually slip into shock and die shortly thereafter. Please, you need to treat Makoto first. Absolutely not, said Byakia, harshly interrupting Mukuro. Tying you up and examining the back of your right hand is our first priority. Hey, Makoto's in danger! Now's not the time for that. Oh wait, this is Aoi. <laughs> hey, Makoto's in danger! And now's not the time for that, said Aoi, as she cast a worried glance at Makoto. She was still having trouble understanding the situation and hadn't decided if Makoto was suspicious or not. Byakuya was about to snap back at her, but Mukuro's action stunned him into silence. She took a deep breath, and then... Mukuro removed the blonde wig from her head. Where there were two long blonde pigtails only a moment before, there was now short, black hair. She cleared her face of all emotion, and when she spoke, her voice rang throughout the gym. I'm not Junko Enoshima. My name is Mukuro Ikusaba. The student stared wide-eyed at her open confession. All she did was remove her wig and clear her emotions, but in doing so, the person the students had, re had recognised as Junko Enoshima vanished from their sight. The terrorists that had taken her place continued to speak in a calm, sto stoic, sto stoic tone. I can never remember how to pronounce that. I helped lock everyone inside this academy. 
the confession on the seaside cliff moment has fine Oh wait a minute, this is Hifumi. The confession on the seaside cliff moment has finally arrived, Hifumi blurted out. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Wigs are against school regulations, Junko. I mean, Mukuro, shouted Tarka. As if stirred by their cries of excitement, the other students began clamouring among themselves. Huh? Oh wait, this is uh, Simpson's yes-man voice. Huh? Said Yasuhiro. So Makoto's wounds are like real? Does that mean that stuff about terrorism, whatever, is all real too? So everything that's happened these past few days wasn't a bunch of staged events. As the reality of the situation began dawning on Yasuhiro, all Leon could say to him was, Shut the hell up! Byakuya just remained calm and addressed Mukuro in a condescending manner. What does your group want? If you're after money, you would have already tried to ne negotiate with me. Of course, I'd rather let them die than surrender to your ransom demands. Our purpose is to fill the world with despair. Byakuya scoffed at this notion and began to speak once again. Hmm, I see. Monokuma said something similar. So that ideology is what fuels your terrorism. It's true. If you did anything to me, you would certainly fill the world with despair. But obviously, that would be impossible for you. Aoi couldn't believe what Byakuya was saying and frowned as she muttered, How self-centred can you be? After confirming that Byakuya had no more questions for her, Mukuro looked at Makoto, whose breathing had slowed, and let her voice show some emotion. But Makoto has nothing to do with this. You can't believe what Monokuma says. What did you say, bitch? shouted Mondo. I don't know what the hell you're talking about. You're a terrorist just like Monokuma said. Mukuro looked away from Mondo and continued speaking. That's true, but Makoto isn't involved at all. Celeste coldly brushed her objection aside. I do not think trying to protect him will do you any good. After all, we all heard Makoto call you by your real name. That's... She had no words. There was nothing she could say to protect... Well, you could mention the whole memory loss thing, right? And say that maybe Makoto was uh, regaining his memories, perhaps? Even though Makoto was truly innocent, though Mukuro was the ultimate soldier, her powers were largely limited to battle. Even a normal high school student could outwit her when it comes to debate and negotiation. If she were the ultimate negotiator, she might be able to convince them that their memories had really been erased. Oh, right. <laughs> okay. So this is the reason, is it? I mean, I don't know. I still think it'd be worth trying. But in a current situation, if she tried to bring up their memory loss, they would think it was a desperate excuse. Even Mukuro knew that. But even if she didn't know what to say, she still knew what to do. Right now, we need to treat Makoto first. And then, she started walking toward Makoto as if nothing had happened. To the others, it seemed like Mukuro had decided to abruptly change the subject. Hold it. We will immediately take Makoto to the nurse's office for treatment. Oh wait, this might be Byakuya. However, we must tie you up. Oh no, that was Sakura. Okay. <laughs> Let's try this again, shall we? Hold it. We will immediately take Makoto to the nurse's office for treatment. However, we must tie you up. This was Sakura's honest demand. But there was no way Mukuro could accept it. If she was separated from Makoto, there'd be no telling what Monokuma would do to him. And between Mondo's hot temper and Byakuya's cold heart, Makoto could easily sustain further injuries under the pretense of interrogation. Furthermore, among these students, Mukuro no knew she was the only one who had experienced treating wounds due to her time with Fenrir. After mulling that over, she narrowed her eyes and went silent. Her mind was made up. She was determined to fight her way out of here and escape with Makoto. I apologise, but I need you to fall asleep right now. As she said that, Oh, right, this is Sakura again saying it. I apologise, but I need you to fall asleep right now. As she said that, Sakura instantly positioned herself behind Mukuro. She was completely within a blind spot. To a normal person, it would have seemed like Sakura had suddenly vanished. After moving faster than any human being could see, Sakura's equally fast hands launched a blow toward the back of Mukuro's neck. However... Sorry, Sakura, but I need to get out of here. Mukuro parried Sakura's fist with a spinning roundhouse kick. Huh. Sakura raised an eyebrow at the unexpected counter-attack. Mukuro tried to use the momentum of a kick to sweep Sakura's feet out from under her. However, Sakura dodged and instinctively struck back against Mukuro's pivot leg. But Mukuro was faster and jumped up, aiming a tornado kick at Sakura's chin. Sakura deflected the attack with one arm, and both combatants leapt backwards, glared, and charged simultaneously. Every blow they dealt was parried and countered by the other, and though they were both unarmed, the sound of their battle echoed throughout the gym. 
It was like a typhoon had been compressed to the size of a car and set loose inside the gym. The other students were powerless to stop them. All they could do was stare at the breathtaking dance of death unfolding before them. After ten minutes had passed, the enormous sound of one final impact rang throughout the gym. The two warriors leapt back once again and breathed heavily, breathed heavily even as they stared each other down. My mistake. Though it's only been a few days, I cannot believe I did not notice such an impressive fighter was hiding among us. I assume that's Sakura. In addition to the surprise Sakura felt, it was as if the battle had left her energised. Mukuro, on the other hand, looked down at her arm, confirmed it had been wounded during the battle, and thought to herself, She's strong. I don't think Sakura is even taking this seriously right now. Despite being constantly surrounded by firearms, blades, traps, and explosives during her time with Fenrir, this was the first time she had ever been wounded. Mukuro was powerless before the might of the woman known as the ultimate martial artist, and the strongest woman in the world. Just as I thought, I can't beat Sakura with my bare hands alone. If she'd been directly ordered to kill Sakura, Mukuro would have opted to either snipe her from a distance or poison her. At this close range, she would need an assault rifle just to stand a fighting chance. I don't have time for this. She looked at Makoto and confirmed that his breathing had grown even shallower. I need to hurry. But at that moment, she had no one to turn to for help. Suddenly, Mukuro had an idea. It was true that gaining an ally in this situation was impossible. However, she could still turn one person into her enemy's enemy. Is she going to reveal that Sakura was the traitor? Possibly, I don't know. Mukuro took a deep breath before she charged at Sakura. Then she immediately fainted and charged at a different girl. Oh no, wait a minute. Toko, who had been cowering in fear from the battle between Sakura and Mukuro in the corner of the gym. Um, is that her speaking? Oh, this is bad! Maybe? Or is that Sakura? I'm not sure. Sometimes it's a bit unclear, but... Well, whatever. Sakura was caught off guard and tried to run after her, but Mukuro was one step ahead and reached Toko first. Oh, why me? I'm sorry. Wait, hold on! What was that sound? <laughs> Mukuro jabbed Toko in a solar plexus and she fell into her arms. Toko and Aoi yelled out in shock. Um, well, it's both of them yelling out, is it? This is bad! She plans to use Toko as a hostage! Toko! In contrast to their shocked faces, Biaki had just snickered and coldly remarked, You fool, do you really think we'd care if you take someone we just met a few days ago as your hostage? Mukuro just softly glanced at Biakia and replied, you didn't meet her a few days ago. What did you say? You met her two years ago. Ah. Bust him with the revelation. <laughs> Byakia scowled. Mukuro ignored him and held her bloody arm in front of Toko's face. And then she yelled into her ears. Wake up, Genocide Jack. Oh, here we go. <laughs> it seemed so random and out of place. Why would Mukuro mention the name of a notorious serial killer right now? If only there were characters in the background during this story, <laughs> instead of just a static image. The students looked at each other with confusion when suddenly, Toko, who had been groaning in pain, suddenly kicked off, kicked off, off, off of the floor of the gym with renewed vigour. She leapt into the air much higher than any normal human should have been able to. While hovering several metres in midair, Toko twirled faster than a professional figure skater. This caused her skirt to flutter, revealing multiple pairs of sparkling scissors. Countless tally marks were scratched into her legs, like a kill count carved into a fighter jet. If not for this situation, Toko's glamorous jumps and spins would have been a sight to behold. The girl formerly known as Toko Fukawa cackled wildly, her red eyes sparkling as her absurdly long tongue flopped out of her mouth. Hey, are you a call for me, and so I appear. I've got a murder IOU for you o uh, Y O U. Ha 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 Toko? The situation had changed so drastically that even Sayaka, who was silent till now, spoke up. Uh, that might be Toko again. Or Genocide Jack, rather. Eh, hey, hey, you're flashing the pan. Don't treat a Genocide Jack like that depressing little four eyes. That dirty girl doesn't bathe herself at all, so I gotta put in five times the effort to rub myself down in the shower. Eek! Toko's sudden change in personality sent the students clamouring among themselves. Hey! Leon yelled. What the hell does that mean? Monokuma just shook his head. There are some things that even I don't understand. The students continued to panic at the strange turn of events. 
Toko, now calling herself Genocide Jack, took out a set of scissors from under a skirt and snipped them with glee as she looked around the gym. Huh? Man, it's been a while since I got to stretch my legs. So what were you guys are do gonna do here at the gym while I was a snoozing anyway? Have an orgy? Oh, I totally understand. You guys are need me to cut up your clothes so you can feel even naughtier. Yeah, right. Why the hell would I do that for you dumbasses? My scissors are only meant for cutting the supple, tender flesh of adorable boys. Genocide Jack was causing a ruckus, but when she saw Makoto laying on the floor, she tilted her head once again. Huh? A bigger Mac, you're like a totally about to die. Oh, what's the deal? Did the world fill you with so much of despair that you all came here to commit a mass suicide? That's a sore heart, but why are you starting it without me? Toko, cried Owie, get a hold of yourself. Genocide Jack ignored Owie and let her emotions run unchecked, jumping and dancing with excitement as she held the scissors. Ah, jeez, I wanted to stab a Big Mac side myself. This is a spot of right to hear, where the ribs are kind of showing already. Is it not even screaming right now, though? Well, what does that mean? Oh well, maybe I can just get used to this feeling of alienation instead. Ha ha ha! I've no idea what's going on anymore, shouted Yasuhiro. This is all the aliens' fault. Yes, a hero buried his head into his arms, but no one was paying attention to him. The student's attention was entirely focused on Genocide Jack. Using that to her attention, Mukuro began sneaking over to Makoto. As she cautiously picked him up, she confirmed that his body temperature, body temperature even, was starting to decrease. I can still make it there in time. Though she was carrying another person, Mukuro managed to soften the sound of her footsteps as she ran for the gym's doors. By the time the students heard Mukuro open the door, it was already too late. She managed to escape the gym with Makoto. However, not everyone was unaware of what Makoto, uh, not Makoto, Mukuro was doing. Monokuma saw her movements out of the corner of his eye, but chose not to tell the students. And one other person, Kyoko Kirigiri. She saw Mukuro carry Makoto away, but did not inform the others as she watched them leave in silence. As everyone wrestled with their own personal thoughts and speculations, Hope Speak Academy began walking a path toward a completely different chaos. Okay, I think we just uh, finished another kind of little chapter there. So, what we're going to do, ladies and gents, we're going to put a bookmark in there on that page in particular, and we're going to wrap this episode up here. So that was episode 56, I believe now, of Danganronpa 2, Goodbye Despair. This is a story uh, taking an interesting direction. Like I say, it would be a bit more interesting if the, um, there was more than just a static background image going on here, maybe if there were characters in the foreground, but then again... I mean, it's kind of nice to, to have our characters back from Trigger Happy Havoc, all of them, that is, and get their voices back on. I know I know, technically Chihiro, Sayaka, and Aoi were all the same voice, but whatever. So yeah, hope you'll join me for part 57 then. We'll continue on. If you're not doing so already, you can follow me on Facebook and Twitter. Link's down below, along with a link to my propagandist channel, where I do various anime-related gubbins. If you enjoyed, don't forget to leave a like, maybe comment below, perhaps uh, share the video with your friends on social media. And if you're not doing so already, why not subscribe to my channel? But in the meantime, I'm signing off now. Goodbye, all. These beautiful music, though. There's violins. Oh, killer whales. Hello. Orcas, whatever you want to call them. Oh, nice guys. Hello, hello. Whoa. Marlinfish? Or sailfish, are they? More sharks, there's a hammerhead. There's a couple of hammerheads actually. Wow. Going over here it seems. Up and up and up again. Whoa! Okay. 